Sometimes we share with first service some tremendous things that happened in our second service, but I want to share something exciting this morning. Faye Fleming, who has been out for seven months, was able to join us for services, and she said she was so excited that uh, that's this, uh, this day is the day she's been dreaming about, about being back with us. And she said, she said a little prayer on the, the way that she wouldn't have a wreck because she was so excited to get back to church. So we want to celebrate with Faye, and she definitely wanted me to pass on to you. Thank you for all the prayers that you've lifted up on her behalf, but she wants to give all the, the praise and the glory to God. Um, also, we've got several folks that are out this week, and we've got all of the crew that's doing Outback, the great ministry that's brought about a lot of positive uh, change in relationships with God and with uh, spouses and with uh, teenagers and their parents. So we've got a big crew that's doing that. Plus, our middle school is absent because they are out on overflow. And normally, I'm, I'm excited about that. But th- this time, uh, I don't know if I'm excited or not because my daughter's on that. And so it's kind of hard for Jill and I to see our kids moving into the middle school and high school programs. But we're excited about Jesse and Shelby being here and the great job that they do. I do want to put in a little plug. If you've got your uh, day timer or your phone that you put a uh, in mark dates mark um, on your day timer November 4th where that is our day for our church-wide prayer event and that's from 12 o'clock noon until 12 midnight and so we're going to be doing some other things to support and get ready for that time uh, Todd White is going to be teaching a class in October and in November and also starting tomorrow, uh, Barry's going to tell you a little bit more about this. We're going to go through 40 days of prayer together, reading back through uh, the cards that were written by our members back in 2009 that are just as exciting to read and just as relevant as they were back then. So hopefully you'll join us in that, and we'll try to provide some tech support to send you messages uh, to remind you of that. But for the next 40 days, getting ready for our November 4th uh, day of prayer together. So get ready for that. Matthew chapter 17 tells a very interesting story. It's uh, the, the great Mount of Transfiguration. And, and Jesus and uh, the three dis- disciples that were kind of the inner core, Peter, James, and John, are, are making their way down from literally this mountaintop experience and seeing the incredible transfiguration of Jesus and the coming together of Elijah and Moses and all this is, is happening. And they're coming down from this and they meet up with the balance of the 12. What are they doing? Well, they're working with a father and his son that has been possessed by this evil spirit. And they're doing their best uh, to help them out, but they're not having any luck. And so Jesus steps up and kind of says, hey, I appreciate your efforts, but uh, let me go in and, and take it from here. And so sure enough, he's able to cast out uh, this demon that's possessing this little boy. So after the crowd has gone, you know, the disciples are kind of sitting there going, okay, what, what's the deal here? Because we've been able to do some similar things in the past, and, and we said the exact same things that Jesus did. And uh, guess what? We even did right hand motions, but we we're ineffective in driving out the Spirit. Jesus, what is the deal here? And in Matthew's telling of this story, Jesus says to them, it's because you have so little faith. If even you had the the faith the size of what? Mustard seed. You could tell this mountain to move and it would. And in fact, nothing will be impossible for you. And so to me, this story is both encouraging, it's also a a little bit scary for me. Because I'm I'm thinking, okay, well these uh, apostles have declared Jesus as Lord. And and they've they've walked away, they've, they've dropped their nets and... And they've walked away from their families. They're, they're dedicated. They know who Jesus is. They've declared him to be Lord. And they're following after him. And yet Jesus is saying, well, if you just had a little bit more faith, you could do some of these things. So that, that's a little bit troubling to me. But it's also exciting. Jesus says, if this faith starts to build even a little bit, there's no limit as what you can do in my name. So that, that's exciting to me. Where are you on your faith journey? If, if we start looking at this movement on, you know, climbing up this mountain face, where are you? Do, do you feel like you're just getting started? You're, you're down here at the base? Or, or, or perhaps you're up on the summit or you're somewhere in, in between. Are you still climbing? Or have you kind of plateaued and been there for a long time, just been kind of content to, to stay there? Or do you find yourself actually kind of climbing back down? 
you're regressing in your faith. We want to talk about some of these things. We want to wrestle with these things. Because this morning we started a, a sermon series entitled, With Ever-Increasing Glory. And of course that comes from Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. In 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18 it says, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory and are being transformed, what a great word, into His likeness with ever-increasing glory. It just keeps going, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So for many of us, well, we, we want to have the, the faith that, that Jesus is describing, and we, we, we want this thing to start growing. We want people to start seeing us glow because we've been in the presence of, of God. We're wanting these things, but sometimes it, it just isn't happening. We spent the better part of the uh, spring as a congregation on our journey series and in, in reality, we're almost talking about Twickenham as a whole, a, a collection. And so where did we start? We started with our core beliefs. We said, you know what? If, if we only have a, a few minutes, almost like you're, you're rescuing things out of a fire, if you have only a few minutes to, to tell someone, what is the core? I, I'm willing to let everything else go. What, what is it that we're, we're going to pick up first and hold on to dear? Well, these are our core beliefs. And then surrounding that is our core values. Because in reality, we as, as a church, like all churches, have, have the same mi mission and, and the, the same desire to go out and, and to love God and to love others and, and to spread the, the, the word of the gospel, the, the Great Commission. Okay, But what is our values? How are we going to do that? Because every church is different. So we have our core beliefs and we have our core values that are shaped from our beliefs. But we also hope they'll shape our ministry practices. So that's what our leadership is involved in, is spending time in prayer and wrestling with these core beliefs and our core values that will drive our practices. That's kind of where we are. So that was the whole journey series. For those of you that were kind of, what was that all about? That's what we were, we were spending so much time on and going through each of the classes, hoping that we get on the same page with our beliefs and our values. Well, this series is a little bit different, and I hope that it's more of an individual thing. Where are you? with your relationship with God. And so I want us to wrestle as individuals, but I want us to also wrestle together so we can see how we can, as Lincoln read, continue working out our salvation with fear and with trembling. But before we can climb, I want us to establish our right to even be on the mountain. What do you mean by that? We have the right to be here with, with God because of our identity. Rick Ashley, which is one of my favorite preachers, tells the story of being caught in the Denver airport. And it was one of those times where he gets there and he's trying to get home, but there's bad weather all over the different parts of the United States. And so he's trying to get out of Denver, but there's a long line at the United Airlines counter. And there's a lot of people trying to get to different destinations. There's only certain airports that are open and areas you can fly into. So the line is backed up in there is a woman that is doing her best um, at, at the counter to accommodate all the passengers that she knew didn't want to be stuck there in Denver. When, when a man who's dressed in a very nice, expensive suit walks up with his briefcase and kind of bypasses everyone else in line, goes up, he breaks in and puts his briefcase down, and he says, let me tell you, I want to be on this flight, and I want to be in first class. That's just what I'm telling you. And so the woman, kind of taken back a little bit, says, well, guess what? There's a long line of people that are ahead of you, and after I help them, I'll do my best to, to help and accommodate you. Well, he kind of spun around a little bit and raised his tone of voice a little bit so everyone could hear. And he says to the woman, do you know who I am? Well, the woman kind of grabs the little microphone over, and she says this, we have a man at the counter who does not know who he is. If you can help him find his identity, please come to the front of the line. You see how important identity is? We have to know who we are, and it's crucial on the journey of life. You know, I've, I've worked with uh, youth groups for years, and you, you find certain lessons that, that kind of connect with teens and others that don't. And so you, you try to keep the ones that do. Well, one that I enjoyed doing over the years for many middle school and high school retreats was a session that I called the labels game. And it's pretty interesting because I would grab like 10 to, to 12 teenagers uh, and I would pull them aside. And with the help of the different adults, 
we would attach these labels to their foreheads and kind of tie them around back here. But we did it kind of like Indian poker where you can't see. Everyone else can see what yours is, but you can't see what's on your forehead. And so we asked them not to tell each other. And then once they got affixed, then we brought them in in front of the group. And the group was, was told, whatever the label is, treat the, your guest panel in that way. And so we seated them up front, just like we have it in chairs here. And so then I would throw out different topics, and then based on their responses, uh, we would treat them. So we had smart, value my opinion. We had funny, laugh at me. And, and generally what I tried to do is do almost the polar opposite of, of what the, a kid was. So if a teenager's coming in, uh, generally I wouldn't get someone that was known as really funny. And, but so they would throw out different things, and no matter what it was, we just crack up, and they're like, wow, this, this is kind of fun. Uh, but you had to find someone that was a particularly uh, strong self-esteem to where stupid sneer at me, okay? Because everything they threw out, whether it was a good point or not, it didn't matter. They were only treating them based on what their labels were. also tried to get usually a older high school girl that had no trouble getting attention and very secure in who she was to where nobody ignore me. And so it was really pretty interesting. We'd go for about 10 minutes into this discussion. We'd throw out different topics. And, and at first, the, the teens, uh, especially if a guy was making some, a good point and they were sneering at him and everything, he would bristle against that because that wasn't a label he was used to wearing. Or someone that wasn't used to being ignored would, would try to do anything, even to make eye contact. And so I would do my best to almost cover that person up to where they feel ostracized, and suddenly they begin seeing their label. And what was interesting is, is after about 10 minutes of this, I would pick different ones and ask them, do you know what your label is? And almost 100% of the time, they got really close, if not exactly what the label was. And so I'd let them take them off one by one and go back and sit into the audience, and I'd pick someone else. What was interesting is each time I, I did this illustration, I always left someone still up on stage. Well, who was that? It was the nobody. I mean, they, they weren't even worth asking how they were feeling about this. So I'd go on and, and talk about labels and how that impacts how we do, and usually someone in the audience would get really kind of mortified and go, Brad, you left one out. And so then I'd go talk with the no boy, nobody. And it, it, what was interesting is just seeing the transformation that took place once they put on these labels. And guess what? The person that's normally and all that funny, after 10 minutes, they're cracking one-liners because everyone's laughing at them. And guess what? The person that usually gets dismissed, but suddenly everyone's valuing their opinion, they're throwing out all kinds of stuff. They start adapting to who their label is. And the person that's usually very secure suddenly becomes very insecure. Labels are important. Labels carry weight, and it's crucial for us to understand how that plays into what we're trying to do. So we have to know our identity, because that's crucial in our life. So we need to realize how important that that truly is. Guess what? I've discovered over life that these labels don't stop in middle school and high school, do they? In fact, some of these continue on, these same exact ones. Perhaps we add in a few others. The rich one, the attractive woman, the drunk, the divorcee, the guy that got downsized, can't hold down a job. And so we start putting on these either positive or negative uh, labels. And what we need to realize is, is these labels are, are very dangerous because they come from an outside-in approach to our identity. And the world describes people by their externals. Guess what? The world also defines us by our externals. Most people get their identity from one of two ways. Uh, to know what these are, just look at magazine covers. Uh, for some, it's performance. What can you do? For others, it's by appearance. And uh, obviously, guys, we tend to get our stroke and, and, and our identity based on performance. You learn at a very young age, how hard can you hit the ball? You know, how often do you strike out? What can, how, how can you tackle? And so some of these things start playing into our performance. How well can you do on a test? 
How much money do you make? What does your second house look like? All these are performance stuff. What's amazing to me is you can see guys that are consumed with this and definitely want people to know where they stack up on the ladder. That's an outside-in approach for women. More times than not, it's driven by appearance. What clothes do you wear? How smooth is your skin? How much do you weigh? Gals talk about it all the time. Did you make homecoming court? You don't look 40. Wow, it's just never ending. So suddenly we begin talking about all these performance things and girls start talking about appearance things. And guess what? As parents, we do this as well. We, we talk about identity and shape our children from the outside in instead of inside out. There's two problems. These are based on realities susceptible to change that you can't control. Women, you can't control that you will age. And there, there are things that, that happen there. If my worth is, is determined by my position at work, what happens if my country, company goes bankrupt? If my self-worth is determined by my net worth, what happens when the market crashes? Your identity is gone. What, what, what happens if, if everything is, is tied into what you can do on the athletic field and your knee gets hit again and, and your coach sends you to the doctor and the doctor says, guess what? You're done, not just for this season. You're done completely. Where's your identity at that point? If your identity is wrapped up in being mom, what do you do when the last one leaves the nest? If our identity is based on externals, it makes what I think about me dependent upon what you think about me. And this is very dangerous. Teens, if you don't get anything else, pay attention to this. When we allow others to fill in the blanks for us as to our identity, we're a slave to them. If we begin saying, do you like me? Am I attractive? Uh, am, am I funny? Can I be in the popular crowd? Guess what? If the answer is no, then we start changing to make the answers yes. And sometimes we change things. They're contrary to what God would have us to do. So, so we, we get the thumbs up. But guess what? If the answer is yes to begin with, then we begin asking, what do I have to do to keep it a thumbs up? And that's where we get into trouble. And it's not just teens. It keeps going throughout life. If we allow others to, to determine our identity. So we need to realize how important that is. What if our identity came from God instead? What if we began looking up instead of looking sideways to allow him to fill in those blanks? You know, we don't need a, a good self-image. We need a God self-image. And if that's true, and if, if we're truly going to buy into that, then I'm not going to allow others to, to hold me hostage. Then I'm going to look up to God to, to provide my, my image and my self-esteem is going to be tied into Him in, in God's self-image. Then it becomes incumbent upon us to figure out what God sees us or how He views us. John chapter 3 tells the story of, of Nicodemus coming to Jesus. And this whole idea of, of being born of water and spirit. And what does he say? guess what you're going to be born again you go from being this to something a new creation a, a, a new creature and paul uh, backs this up in second corinthians 5 17 where he calls us that have been united with christ as new creations so maybe in our search for who we are we should begin to embrace this idea that we're this new creation that that god sees us as born again it's, it's almost like, I, I love the Etch-A-Sketch, because you can make all these mistakes on there, and what do you do if you don't like it? You just you just shake it, and it, the slate becomes clean. And that's what Jesus says, my blood does this for us, so that you can create a new image, not from the outside in, from the inside out. So important for us to understand this. Adults, it, it happens to us, as, it's not just teenagers. And guys, this isn't just a New Testament thing. Ezekiel 36 and verse 26 says this, And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you, and I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. The good news of the gospel is this. It's forgiveness of sins. Amen? But the good news of the gospel is also the formation of the heart. 
See, if, if we embrace the former without the later, guess what? It gives us a truncated understanding of the gospel that allows us to do this. I can be forgiven, but I can still wear this label. I can still see myself as, as a forgiven, stupid person because the world is still giving me input on that. And so it becomes very destructive unless we can see ourselves as new creations that God is filling in the blank for us. He desires for us to have this formation of the heart, and that's what this series is about. It's this ever-increasing glory. It's what God is doing. So we need to realize that we have been set free from this old identity to take on a new one found in Christ. I lived up in Connecticut for a while, and so uh, you don't realize how close the states are. They're all, uh, they're, you know, uh, Rhode Island's a little bit bigger than Huntsville. I mean, they're, they're tiny, and they're all in there. So we'd do a lot of driving around, seeing the fall foliage and stuff. And up in New Hampshire, they've got license plates that have a cool slogan. It comes from the phrase from a revolutionary war hero, General John Stark, that says, live free or die. And I thought, well, that's pretty bold. And you're like, yeah, I want to live in a state that says, live free or die. Of course, it's kind of ironic that the license plate are made by guys in prison. So, you know, they're sitting there stamping these things out, and they're like, live free or die. Oh, I don't know what to do here, you know? And if we're only embracing the forgiveness portion that comes from the death of Christ, guess what? We're still imprisoned. Do you realize that? Because we're still holding on to our old label and our old identities. The forgiven drunk that still stays drunk that, that doesn't hold any power for those that are wrestling with, with uh, alcohol. Why? Because I want to see a success story. I want to see what God has done on the other side. I, I don't want to just be in the same place doing the same things, but also go to church. That's not appealing to those that wrestle with the same sins as you. We want to have victories. That victory can only come from a new identity and a new power that comes from the Holy Spirit to make us into a new person god gives us a new identity and the old one is discarded you ever notice that when god personally encounters people throughout scripture that sometimes he changes their name so we have uh jacob who you know is this deceiver he's doing all these different things he wrestles with god and what's his new name israel and so God says, I want to give you a new name. And so you have Saul that, that's there when, when Timothy is being stoned and he's persecuting Christians. And he says, I encountered Jesus on the road. And he changed my name to Saul is gone. Guys, we can't hold on to Saul. We, we can't say, well, I'm still Saul, but I've been forgiven of some of the things I'm doing. No, that's a, a, an old identity. God's asking us to start afresh to become Paul. That's what he's calling us to do. Guys, it, it can't happen unless we're embracing who God is calling us to be. Well, okay, if we get rid of what we're not, what do we fill our blank in? What's the name that God calls us? We're going to wear a new identity. Well, what do we call ourselves? Well, we get together with a bunch of Christians. Well, in reality, that phrase is only used three times in the New Testament. 68 times. Those that have been called according to Christ are called the saints. 68 times in the plural, he describes people that gather together. Each person sitting in these stools is called a saint. Now, I know what you're thinking, and sometimes I I think that that term has been hijacked by other faith groups to kind of describe some superhuman individual who's no longer with us who has lived this great life of, of charity and heroic virtue. And, and, and if we, we give it a few years to see if there's not some cl- something going to come out of the closet and everyone keeps saying they're a good person, then we'll bestow upon them the title of saint. That's not what we see in Scripture. You become a saint based on what Jesus has done, not based on what you have done throughout your life. 68 times we're called this. What do we know about this term saint? Number one, all Christians are saint. It's a one-step process to sainthood. I unite myself with Jesus Christ. From then on, I'm called a saint. And guess what? I'm set apart. I'm living according to his purpose. 
in his glory. That's what it means to be a saint, someone that's set apart. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1 says this, Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. I wonder if he put an asterisk there in the original text. Everyone that's at the church except Yodia and Cynthia. Well, they're fighting. Those two gals are going at it. Don't they realize everyone else is saints, but not these two? No, to all the saints. It doesn't mean we're perfect, but we're called according to his purposes. Romans 1 and verse 7. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you from our God and Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're all in this together. We all wear the title of saint. Number two, in Scripture, there's no such thing as a second-class saint. Let that soak in. God does not call us to what we will be. He calls us to what we are now because of his son, Jesus. You know, I grew up in Dallas. We're following the Dallas Cowboys is listed as, as a religious preference. Uh, and we have the Texas Stadium with, you know, the, the top wasn't there so God could see down on his team. And, boy, you know, it, it truly is religion. Well, growing up, there was an all-pro safety on Tom Landry's doomsday defense. It was, his name was Charlie Waters. And the Cowboy legend tells a story of when he was at Clemson playing wide receiver for legendary coach Frank Howard. And they had a big game upcoming, and the, the church was a little bit squeamish because their first and third string quarterbacks uh, were out on injured reserve. And so uh, they were definitely thin at the quarterback position. And then in one of the big practices early in the week for their big game, uh, their second string quarterback took a shot to the knee, and he was out for the season. So that left Coach Howard in a terrible position because he was down to his fourth-string quarterback, a gangly, uncoordinated kid who inspired no confidence. So Coach Howard pulls his number one athlete, Charlie Waters, aside, and he says, listen, do you mind taking a few snaps and, and seeing if you could take a go at this? You're, you're my best athlete. When Waters begged off, Howard realized he had no choice but to play the gangly fourth-stringer. So the next day of practice, what does he do? He gathers the whole team together, and he brings in this fourth-string quarterback. He puts him right in the big middle, and he, he starts out this way. Boy, do you believe in magic? And all the guys start snickering, knowing that the coach is up to something. And this fourth-string quarterback says nervously, Boy, yeah, yes, sir, coach, I, I believe in magic. With that, Howard gets all ten of his fingers. He goes over the boy's head, and he says this. He says, poof, you're the first team quarterback. And so, in reality, he now takes on this new identity. Did he earn it? No. But in the, in the team's mind, in the coach's mind, he is now the first string quarterback. It happens instantaneous. That's what happens with our sainthood. God has given us this. You know, whether we think ourselves in this way or not, we are first string saints. God, our coach, does not call us to what we will be, but what we are in his eyes. That doesn't mean that we're not going to grow and keep developing. Absolutely, we're called to do that. And, and in fact, the, the word for saint is in a group with, um, that takes the same root as, as sanctify and sanctification. Of course, God wants us to keep growing in him. That's what this series is about, this ongoing faith in what God is doing. Well, what's our message for today? I want to give you confidence. I, I want to give you confidence that you have the right to be on this mountain. Because a lot of Christians say that they're forgiven, but don't feel confident to come before God. They don't feel confident to, to really explore their faith and continue growing. I want you to realize it's not because of what you've done, but what Jesus has done. We wear the title of saint, and I hope, just like these young adults, that we gave them different identities if we start plastering down on our forehead, we'll start living up to it. We'll start seeing ourselves in a new way, that we won't see ourselves as, as, as someone that, that has this label that, that's been forgiven, but we'll truly see ourselves as what God is doing within us. But guess what? Satan is not going to be happy. Satan wants us to hold on to that label, maybe to, to, to put it in my back pocket while I'm at church, but then I'm going to pull it back out and say, yeah, this is who I am. Now Satan wants us to do that but jesus says no man have faith 
Because when we start taking steps and start really uh, exploring what it means to be a saint, guess what? God says, I'm going to work on your heart. Your faith is going to grow even to the size of a mustard seed, and nothing, nothing will be impossible. As we begin this series, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to, to be in God's Word, to, to test His Word and see what God is, is telling you. I also want you to spend time in prayer asking God to open your heart. For some, you've been plateaued for an awfully long time. Now is the time to break free from that. Now is the time to keep growing. Now is the time for you to keep ascending to the glory that God wants you to. If not for, for your benefit, also for the benefit of those behind you, that you can help them up and show them the way as well. He wants to say focused on prayer, focused on the Word, and open to where God is leading us to ever-increasing glory in Jesus Christ. Steve?